how language can be a barrier of knowledge. Like how people can see like there's a lot happening, but they don't really understand if you don't speak a language. So that's another reason why there's so much imbalance in the NFT world. Right now it's focused in one place, even though there's people that has benefited from NFTs in places like Ethiopia, Africa. NFTs should transcend that language barrier. Like not everything should become like just being in this in this one place and like try to like diversify like the cultures, language that we speak, instead of having artists adapt to whatever's happening in this niche space. Matt, what's happening, man? How you doing? Sam, doing great. Doing great. How about yourself? Good, man. Good. You got to warm up that voice, bro. Crack oh, it sound- in. We got a full podcast ahead of ourselves. Oh, sound a little raspy, but I'm going to get through Go it. Go, Ray, me. No, who <laughs> we got lined up today? Really excited about our guest today, Sam. Um, we have Ixels, uh, a Panamanian generative artist and creative coder who has become the highest selling female NFT artist. Um, many may know her for her $2 million sale for her piece Dreaming at Dusk uh, with the Tor Project. Uh, she has an incredible story on how NFTs have changed her life and the lives of her family. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think on my side, it was amazing to, to speak with her. Um, I think her talking about how NFTs are growing in Latin American countries like Panama is really special. I know there's like uh, tend to get lots of first mover advantage in lots of the kind of major metro areas within the U.S. So for her to be really at the forefront and inspire others around her is really fascinating. Um, and even too, just the life changing story that NFTs have had within her her life. She's been able to buy her family a home, help her brother leave a job he hated in order to pursue other things. So I think this really just shows the the power of NFTs as technology to to truly change people's lives. So. Uh, visionary artist, really enjoyed speaking with her. Um, for everybody that's listening, if you haven't already, do want to you do want to encourage you to go check out some of the mini documentaries and videos we're sharing on our YouTube channel, deconstructing how different artists are are thriving and pushing forward in this space. So that's youtube.com slash NFT now. But without any further ado, very special episode with Ick Shells. It's such a pleasure to have you on the NFT Now podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. Um I'm happy because uh, I'm finally able to travel to the U.S. and see you all in person. Um, lots going on, so I'm just taking in the, the emotions and trying to focus on, on what's coming. I love that. Well, How about you? Oh, it's been, we're, we're great. You know, everything NFT 100 in the rear view. Congratulations on being on the list as well as one of our creators. Uh for, for those who are listening, why don't we just start with a little bit about your backstory? Tell us a little bit about how you got into generative art and how you made the jump from NFT into NFTs. Generative art. Uh, I think generative art got in, into me, to be honest. Um, I, I moved to Toronto, um, Canada, about six years ago. And uh, I was working different jobs while studying architectural technology. Um, I really love architecture and everything that has to do with uh, structures, buildings mixed with nature. So I was pursuing that career, but um, at the time it was too expensive for me to um, pay for school and pay for rent and everything. So I decided to stop. for a bit until I found this computer science course. And I have always been into computers um, uh, as a tech support since I got out of high school. And even before that, with my dad, uh, just having um, all this uh, engineer um, duties. Uh, He was a telecommunications engineer, so he had all these artifacts in his garage, in his workshop. So I used to play with computers since since very little. And then I, when I saw there was an opportunity for to study computer science in a good school, I I just got 
fluent to to research and learning bits of everything. And I remember one of the first things I I learned was uh, how to make pixels into into crypto and cryptographic key into uh, creating art that could contain a message. And I just fell in love with that idea. And ever since then, uh, I've been diving into making uh, art out of data. Um, it was a escape for me. It was a way for for me to be close to um, something that I, I care about while I was away, all by myself in a big city, trying to make it. <laughs> so it became more than a hobby. It became part of who I am. Um, I think one of one of the main things I like to do with this technology is that I can preserve my memories, my photos, my everything that I've been archiving for the past few years in the form of art and data. So I look up to that every day. That's absolutely amazing. And I mean, it's been great to see a lot of your, your journey within the NFT world and some of the success you've been able to have. Can you talk a little bit about um, like how NFTs have changed your life? NFTs, NFTs. It's, I think I read the other day that at some point we're going to be calling NFTs uh, a file or the technology that, that we're using as a medium. And it is true. It's, it's something that got me curious again in um because I was really into I was really into this routine of creating art and not doing that much research anymore. So when I saw projects like Art Blocks and different projects that came out during um uh, the first wave of 2020 uh 21. Um, I was, I just got super curious that how you could, how could a collector be able to manipulate how the art looks at the end by just acquiring this, the cryptographic key or, or the token. And it, I just got interested with, um, in a specific project called Ringers, um, by Dimitri Chertniak, he um, he's been one of my biggest supporters even since before all of this, uh, since 2019, and um, I've been following his journey and how how he builds not only a story but he builds something that can last. So when I saw he created this project that he was so connected to and, and in love with, I I realized I wanted to try and do the same. Um, it was a way for him to to also get income and <clears throat> being able to fund different other different projects. So I started minting my first pieces. And actually, my first piece was collected by Dimitri. Um, he he that that was enough for me to pay for gas. Um, <laughs> being able to mint more pieces. So I never asked for anything. I was just sitting in my computer, looking at Twitter for the first time in years and learning, learning what people were doing, how they were behaving, where things were going. And uh, it became just part of another data research. Well, at the same time, it, you know, with data, you can create so, much, so many beautiful pieces and, and art. So that's what got me into NFTs along with many other different events. Um. Sure, sure. And and I know that it's been really transformative for you in your life and, and also for your family. I know that, that NFTs have been able to give you the means to uplift your family. Can you talk a little bit about that? I became the pillar of my family by being able to, to you know, do basic things like buying groceries and buying a house, for my mom, my brother, tell my brother to stop working in that job that was making him really miserable and bitter. Uh, so 
I told him to that I could take care of them like they were taking care of me when I came back to Panama in 2019. When I came back to Panama, I didn't have uh, much saved up because everything I would make in Toronto was for school or for rent or sending back to my mom. So when I came back, uh, just right before the pandemic, like three months before, I was just so, I was depressed. I was in in my room for months and at a time and just sitting on my computer and back to bed, not really, not really expecting to, to find a job right away. So my family really supported me for the, the past two years. My mom works in the main hospital in Panama. And when the pandemic started, I was just so worried that she had to wake up super early. Sometimes the cars wouldn't take it to take her to 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 the, her job. Um, we didn't have a car. And you know, people will say no to people that were dressing like nurses or you know that or going to the hospital because they were scared. And uh, I remember being really, really scared. And at the same time, NFTs were starting. Um, were starting to like rise. And I, was, I wasn't really paying attention to, to those opportunities back then. A friend told me about a super rare and about Ethereum. And I didn't really pay attention because I was just trying to make uh, a leave-in for, for my family while at home, while depressed. But during those days, um, I saw opportunities to, to uplift others by creating events. For example, I, I did this audiovisual show in New York remotely. I had the opportunity to, to showcase about 200 artists in, the, in a gallery in New York both virtually and physically. And I realized like how much I was connected to my life online. And that was the only way that I could possibly do anything that was meaningful enough that I could feel good about and at the same time provide to my family. Um, we didn't, we, we sold tickets for those events, but we use that money to give back to the, to the artists as a form of nanograms. And we even won a, a Tally Award. And it was, um, it was more than I expected. I didn't expect that that, that level of <clears throat> attention from artists and enthusiasm. It was almost like we, we woke up there their will to to create art and to showcase that nothing not everything was lost so i think i got can contain um i got that feeling back i i felt the same way and it gave me that strength i needed to to help my family and continue that's absolutely incredible and uh i think you know it's amazing to hear you to you, you talk about it and and to think about just how transformative the power of this technology can be um you know i first became aware of your work um after you made headlines in may of last year with the 2 million dollar sale of dreaming at dusk uh which i know you created uh to support the tour project can you tell us a little bit about how that collaboration came together yes of course um, tour so I recently talked about this uh, with someone that is um, writing a book. And it just hit me that I really, I'm really proud of this. Um, I mean, it didn't just hit me, but it's just that feeling again, it's hard to get when you do something and then you get, it, time passes. But uh, I recently felt I connected to this whole thing again. Um, yeah, I remember being reached out by um, Antonella. Uh, Antonella is a, was the product designer for Tor, and she 
she said, hey, I really love your work. Like, it reminds me of this old glitch art style or analog style of black and white art that I love. And I think it will go well with the that feeling of nostalgia that we want to transmit with this project. Um, so she told me more about the project, that it was about celebrating the, the beginnings of tour, the first onion service they created. And I just immediately said, yes, I said, yes. I, I, I hadn't worked in any project that big before, not, nothing like that. And I just realized that it was, it was tour, something that I use, something that I care about for school, that I learn about, um, during those days I was learning about cryptography. And yeah, I just immediately say, say yes to the idea. I started sharing bits of it with my friends, with people online, on Twitter, and doing my own research and learning more about how it all started because I had an idea that it was also deep and like rooted in internet history. That's amazing. Um, so... Yeah, we decided to mint uh, this token. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect, um, but when she saw the work, she said, I really, really love it. Uh, it reminds me of an old book. And that is, it reminds me of a notebook that is that contains data and just clips flickering through time. Um, I added a camera that will approach like the viewer. So when when you see the piece, you can see like it's zooming in. So it gives you that feeling of, okay, you're passing through this information that's encrypted on this website. And now it's encrypted inside my art. So there's layers and layers of information that are like just approaching you as the date of the anniversary of tour approach. So that was the idea and the whole concept behind the piece. Um, I I really enjoyed seeing how people were connecting to what something that's so important like uh, cybersecurity, keeping your information safe, keeping people people's eyes away from what you search. Um, and also understanding that Tor is not only for individuals, but it helps groups, groups in the borders, in uh, Brazil, in places in of conflict. And uh, you realize only after something really happens that how important it is. Um, so I was proud, proud to share. I was connected with the idea, flowing with it. And I think more people got connected with it and got many messages before the drop, um, before the, the auction. And uh, I think I wasn't ready for so many people to gather in an auction, but it happened. Um, I was in the clubhouse with my friends from Her Story Dow, um, with Diana Sinclair, with uh, Nancy Howard, um, Latasha was there too. As as I felt like I was surrounded by by family while while looking at what was happening. I was sitting in a corner of my room in Chorrera, in Panama. In this corner, a small corner, super uncomfortable room. Just like I had a tiny desk and my computer. That's it. And I was just looking at at the the screen how things going up and up and up. And that's so, it's just so exciting to, to hear and to see what's happening, that so many people were interested in, in a project that I was part of. I love that. No, it's an abs- a very, very special journey and amazing to see all the support from the community. Now, I'm curious too, I mean, another really interesting project that you worked on was the um, or was, well, actually how Pleaser Dow collected that piece and how they curated it with their Sotheby's natively digital sale. I'm curious how you feel like DAOs are really changing the game for artists and their ability to, to kind of uplift and support artists. 
Yes. Um, so I think I didn't finish the, the what I was saying, but um, yeah, Blizzard Dell got that piece, and I realized like how much they they were into just getting pieces of the internet that were historic and making a sort of a museum out of it. Um, I wasn't part of the DAO immediately, uh, but I was just so so interested on, on knowing more of what was going on and how, how they could help um, continue this project being highlighted, um, bring, bring on board all their artists or just understand how they were working. I think DAOs can be that that sort of support that artists need more in times like this, where there's so much uncertainty. Um, in a way, I think DAOs should should create that that base that is secure and that keeps artists. Um, I focus on their on their work and creating more art while um, while there's a, a sort of platform or or collection that is created for posterity and um, being able to preserve artifacts that are so important that in 50 80 years from now it's gonna be looked back and people will talk about this as history. It's already history. Um, yeah, that's something I, I care a lot about, just archiving important things. So if DAOs, if there's if there's a function of DAOs that I'm interested about, is how to collectively preserve uh, these moments in time and, and history and keep supporting like the people that are that are trailblazing through through the times. Like no matter what, art will always be um, constant, just as I think writing is. Like no matter what happens, like if there's, you know, war, if there's conflict, if there's anything, pandemics, like uh, all these write-ups will will last through time, and people will will do whatever they need to do to put their express themselves. So I think it's an one of the most important assets we can we can possibly think about helping preserve or just keep safe. Yeah, I fully agreed, and I love I love that perspective. Um, you know, it, it's really incredible when you when you zoom out and think about it, like you're now the highest selling female NFT artist, which is an incredible achievement. Um, but there's still a major disparity in sales between male and female artists in the space. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how, how can we close that gap and create more equity in the NFT space? Well, I think I've been the highest for way too long. <laughs> if you think about it, it's been two years. And for sometimes, even the same day, I joked about, okay, like I'll be here to give you the, the, the crown next queen. Uh, at some like for two women that were approaching me and feeling inspired and feeling um, feeling like they could reach this level of success uh, I would tell them like yeah I'm here to give you the the crown next thing I'm still waiting <laughs> uh, it needs it's a proof that it's a proof that there's not enough opportunity for for everyone to, to get to this level. Um, I think it's something that we will eventually change. But I, I kind of believe more in the sustainability of space, of the space of keeping people, you know, funds flowing for artists and for builders. <clears throat> and I think having a record for me, is a uh, something that I'm really proud of. I'm the only one in Panama that has ever been auctioned in any uh, auction house in the world, and um, I have like I have broken a lot of records in, in my tiny country, 
as it's just something that people are starting to get to know here because before I was under the radar, I, I was living in a way and I didn't want many people to know what was happening except for, you know, in, I guess the English speaking side of, of the world where is where I spend most of my time. Uh, it's interesting to see how language can be a barrier of knowledge, like how people can see like there's a lot happening, but they don't really understand if you don't speak a language. Um, so that's another reason why there's so much imbalance in the NFT world. I feel like it's all like right now it's focused in one place, even though there's people that has benefited from NFTs in places like Ethiopia, Africa, uh, like different countries in Africa. And, but it's not enough. So I think NFTs should transcend that language barrier. Should, like not everything should become like just being in this, in this one place and like try to like diversify like the cultures, language that we speak instead of having artists adapt to whatever's happening in this niche space. There's groups that, that have been formed, for example, Unicorn Dao, and uh, many initiatives by, by artists like People Pleaser, which like, I'm, really, I'm really close to, we talk all the time, and it's, she's just full of ideas. Um, she keeps building different stuff and that are interesting and that open doors for, for others to, to have an opportunity. I, <clears throat> one thing that I, that I can tell is that people still focus a lot on the following, on, on like who's in certain outlet, who's not. Um, which is great. Uh, there's also so much great art out there that is not seen or recognized. I think one of the reasons why I spend so much time on the internet is because I was just obsessed with sharing art and getting that that feeling of um, curiosity back every time. Every time I found someone, that no matter the following, they do something that is interesting, I will share. And that's how I, I grew um, these other social media accounts that I, I manage, communities, on my own. Um, and I think uh, that's another way to help, keep helping is uh, sharing art that is hasn't been discovered yet, keeping that, um, that rhythm. I guess, I guess people forget and then you focus too much on what's happening, what who's already winning instead of going back and seeing like, hey, maybe there's someone that could win uh, and could like potentially uh, being able to sustain themselves, fund their own projects and just continue doing art if you just pay attention. And that's what happened to me. Someone pay attention and then they kept paying attention and making me feel pumped and that I, my art matter, and that what, what I was doing was could touch them in other ways and just a sale. So um, I think we, we should continue doing that for others. That, that may create that, that balance that we need. So there's more, I guess, more opportunities for others to reach high sales or galleries all over and the opportunities that I've, I've been able to have myself. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And it's been amazing to see all the support you've had. Now you're using your platform and kind of working and uplifting other artists. When it comes to NFTs developing, and I mean, I know like Matt and I live in New York City. And New York City tends to get first looks at all of the new technology and trends. Um, similar, you got like Silicon Valley or Los Angeles. Um, but when it comes to, it tends to take longer for 
different technologies that are popular here to get popular elsewhere. Um, you spoke to this a bit, but how do you see NFTs developing in other Latin American countries like Panama? And what are other things you think the kind of NFT community at large can do to help accelerate this, uh, the adoption and make sure that some of the opportunities that artists are getting in the States aren't only reserved for people in the States? Of that question, because um, I've been talking, I've been preaching about how Panama, it's, it's so, um, it's a place to develop. Like there's so much happening here that the crypto laws were recently approved by the president. Um, I was able to talk to some of the politicians leading this um, this new bill that was launched. And they were learning about what happened in places like El Salvador and they've been learning about NFTs and pro trying to create um, these paragraphs in the bill that will protect artists and will protect what we're producing. So um, I see the future for Latin America starting by Panama becoming a hub for artists and for galleries and for anything NFT related. I, I see a bright future for some I've been really involved with, with talks with uh, different groups. Um, recently, the Ethereum Foundation, they uh, reached out and they wanted to get to know me. Um, I'm going to be participating in uh, Bogota, ETH Bogota, and uh, talking about like how NFTs have, have changed life for me, which is something that people know in Latin America and they're um, interested, but they don't see there's a viable opportunity for them because first, like not many people in Latin America uses Twitter or English Twitter. And there's also so much that you need to do and, and let go of to be able to be part of NFTs. Like many of us had to leave our jobs, right? And leave whatever was happening outside the noise and concentrate to create this, this world we see now. So I kind of want to talk about it when, when the opportunity comes and see if we can uh, get artists inspired and like take the risk. It's, it's, it's not only, I don't see it as a risk, but I see it as like a new life. Something that if you really want to change everything in your life and people around you, you, you should try. Um, so yeah, I can't wait for, for people to start traveling to Panama, for people who are like, hey, let's, let's go to this like show that happens every year and it's in Panama. That's, those are things that I'm looking forward to. I think, I think uh, here's beautiful. It's, there's beautiful people, like warm, and I'm not only trying to promote like tourism in the country, but like there's people here that deserve the opportunity. Poverty is high. We're tiny. We're only 3.5 million people. We could easily be uh, giving everyone a good place to live, but it's not happening because everything's centralized. Um, proof of that is that the city of Panama that looks a lot like Miami. Everything is just here, and the rest of the country is abandoned, basically. And I think NFTs could totally change that reality and try to give you know, autonomy to, to other provinces, to groups that are potentially in danger for climate change. Um, for example, there's an, a set of islands called Gunajala, which are our native people. And these islands are disappearing slowly due to erosion and this, the ocean is rising. And when, when the people from Ethereum Foundation and the film they're doing decided to come to film about my life and my work, I, I saw this as an opportunity to show what's happening around here 
what people from other countries, developed countries, can see that can be fixable. And if we do it on time, we can save not only the economy of these groups, but their lives, their livelihoods. Um, so, yeah, those are like one of the many, many thoughts that I have surrounding like, the future of NFTs in Latin America, and Panama especially. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that perspective. It's super valuable to learn, uh, and and very very um, uh, excited to to learn more and see and see more uh, development in in, in the region um, at large when it comes to Web three NFTs and and beyond. Um, and you're you're obviously uh, an important figure uh, in in the development of that. So, um, I'd I'd love to also chat a bit about. Um, Creative Code Art. I know that's a, an organization you you co-founded. Um, you know the idea of like code as an art form, and just like what excites you the most about the future of generative art. Um, creative Code Art is a platform that was created by me and a friend who lives in a country that is uh, very restrictive. Um, they don't really like to give much information, like pretty much anonymous. So um, it's, a, it's a proof that how the internet can change someone's life, even when you live far away in a place where th- they, they don't like to express. Uh, and um, it became more than, than just, you know, pastime when I started learning about Cold art myself. It was around the same time. And it just inspired us, inspired me to, to help learn how to how to read more behind the code. Like not just seeing the output, but the person that was behind it. That there's um, you know, while while they were sharing their stories or just by following their journey. And I've seen so many people just grow so much, not only in social media, but um, just in their lives. Like they got, you know, a new plot there or they um, they are no longer working with just single output, but with machine learning and dancing and combining different techniques. So that all fed my, my imagination way more. Um, and also, I think it's a it's grown so much from from the time where I start started sharing to now. Um, I saw this uh, uh, as a way to to share information that's happening. I, I'm constantly sharing stories about recent events. Um, not so much lately because I, I've been so busy, but I realized like maybe it's time to get to get help in that sense. And uh, there's other artists that that share in the account and share uh, the art and and then stories. So <clears throat> yeah, I think it's um <laughs> it's one of those journeys that never stop happening. It's a it's a community. Um, it grew organically, and I met many of my friends and people that are successful in NFTs now through that um, account. And um, regarding the future of NFTs, um, I think eventually uh, NFTs are not going to be the way for, for artists to sell their art, but to also show it uh, as a social media platform. Um, I think um, there's there's going to be a way for us to create our own uh, websites where people will, will go in and feel like they don't want to stop going. Because obviously UX design and the way you build things makes you want to keep going back, reading and, and, and watching whatever is happening. And if we're able to learn how to, how to do that ourselves, how to create an experience that, is, that gives people that, you know, that sense of 
connection with what you're doing without depending on a centralized platform. I think that that, that could be a future that I, I look up to with this technology. Um, there's so many more uses. Um, I'm just starting to learn about um, you know, how to use all this data that I've been collecting to help uh, shift the dynamics of the art, making it, making it a deterministic piece or something that can be interactive and on real time. And it's so, so interesting. Um, I use a software called Touch Designer. And for now, there's no bridge between Touch Designer and web. Um, and programs like processing or other programs that lets you create um, interactive works online or on websites. But uh, apparently there's, there's some tricks. It's just a really hectic, really long uh, script to write. But that's like, uh, imagine like all of these communities that use a Stoge Designer or other type of programs that can't really be used on the web browser. Um, using being able to use nfts that's a whole lot of a whole other community that could chime in and add to to what's happening to the market to not only that but the types of arts that you make with those softwares are so different so there's much more people to onboard and create this like tools that that they're able to use also from the traditional art side, imagine like just people that don't know how to use NFTs. They 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 see it and they see okay, it's only for digital artists, but what if it's for everyone? So um, yeah, I, I just see the future of NFTs uh, with so many more so many more tools to be created, so many so many people to onboard people that uh, don't see this as Viable opportunity, viable opportunity right now, but I obviously there's so much potential, you know, for podcasts, for magazines, for illustrators, for people that work with their hands. I just think that there's so many ways that that, that we can use this, and we, it just hasn't been discovered yet, which makes it more interesting. Yeah. It's a very, very exciting time, and it's fun to see how you're experimenting and pushing the space forward. And we're all incredibly excited as it uh, we kind of unleash the potential of the technology to help empower more people. So it's a super fun time for sure. Um, well, as we come towards a close, I'm curious, like, what projects you have coming up? Obviously, uh, what's what's I mean, we're about halfway through the year. What's on your mind? What are you hoping to to work through as with the remainder of the year? Yeah, um, right now I think the biggest project will be happening in London. Um, not sure if I can talk about it yet. <laughs> uh, can I talk about this? Uh, um, yes, I'll be participating in Freeze London. And that's, I think that's going to be the first time that NFTs are are going to be able to be part of this show. I'm not sure. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But either way, um, there's so many first times for NFTs. But this one is it's, it's really interesting for generative art specifically. Um, I'm currently part of a show at Christie's. Um, I'm giving, I gave away one of my pieces uh, is called Thalamic Pulse, and it's in favor or benefiting MAPS, which is a multidisciplinary psychedelic research in, um, association. And it's, a, it's just another time in history I feel super proud of supporting an organization that helps change and shape lives and including my my own life. Um, I learned about this when I was in Toronto. Um, 
I wasn't part of a, a guy that um, um, psychedelic therapy, but I did my own research and um, I did try psychedelics during those days. Not only inspired by by the research that was happening, but with about the potential and how it could really change me. Um, I did it with a group of friends, and we just started doing art, <laughs> playing music, painting, um, crying, talking about things that are really hurtful, and also things that makes us really happy. I think it was the first time I talked about my father um, when I my father passed away when I was 14. And I hadn't been able to speak about it for years. I even stopped talking during the last few years of high school. I became muted. Um, I was just going to school, sitting in my desk, and going back home without saying a word for two or three years. And uh, I remember all those things when I tried psychedelics for the first time, when I tried shrimp specifically and MDMA. And um, give me, I think it's when all of this, my art and everything started, to be honest, because I started looking at the world in a different way. Um, patterns that I see in nature and architecture where more visible for me, more interesting. I just couldn't focus on anything else. Um, it gave me joy to find that, to see that there's there was something else, something special that I could uh, be part of. And it was just with myself. I didn't depend on anyone to, to be able to see the things. And it's been living with me all along. So, I just want more people to learn about this, about how you can you can really help yourself. And this is something you can do with meditation, with paying attention to something that is mindful. Um, but obviously, not everyone can focus that much. So sometimes you need a help. And when you have this this type of medicines. Uh, when you let this type of medicines enter your body and just shape you, reset you, and like maybe make a plan in your mind that can potentially become something else. Uh, things like the magic that's been happening in my life could happen to someone else. So... Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I, I say yes to, to participating in, in these events. And it's the option ends tomorrow, but I think there's time for other collectors to, to join and like try to help uh, raise more so this, this organization can remain uh, decentralized and be funded by collective rather than just a group of people. So, yeah, really happy to share share this results with you all. And also I'll be participating in, in other shows in, in Europe uh, in July, the, the first week of July. I'll be in Rotterdam uh, for a museum show and in Barcelona. Um, I was invited to eat Brazil. I really want to go, but I don't know how I'm going to divide myself to be able to be there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's happening. It's, everyone's just like trying to make their own uh, NFT city all over the world. So uh, it's just happy to have the opportunity to be part of, of it. Regardless of the opportunities I've been getting, I think there's still more doors to open. There's still more people to reach. And so I've, I've been working nonstop on just acknowledging that 
this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and I I just have to be able to uh, not let it go and turn it into something into something more. Absolutely. Well, uh, I think it's it's very clear that you're doing just exactly that. And uh, it, it's an incredible story and something that I, I think you're a real inspiration to a lot of people uh, in the space and people who are looking to enter the space. And so um, really, really grateful to have had this conversation with you today um, and excited to see what's on the horizon as you continue to, to chart forward and, uh, and um, you know, keep, keep creating and, and opening those doors uh, for others. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you all. Um, what you've built is so inspiring. Um, like I don't see like any other outlets for artists that are, you know, legit to to be a part of. So yeah, congrats again on your success as well. On you know doing a show in the Rainbow Room. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> What I saw, you were missed. Like, you were missed, but but uh, <laughs> luckily, luckily, our, our NFT 100 is a, is an annual celebration of the top 100 creators and community figures in the space. So uh, there's always next year. Yeah, well, I'll keep working, so I'm part of next year's wave. Either way, I'll be cheering you up and be there. Well, Love thank that. You. Thank you, and uh, we will we will chat again soon. Take care. Man, we'll really enjoy that that conversation. What stood out to you? It's just so powerful to hear firsthand how NFTs have changed her life, uh, the lives of her family members, and have really given her uh, a whole new lease on living a life as a creative. Um, you know, it, it's it's a very powerful. We often say NFTs are changing lives every day, but this is one of the most powerful stories that I've heard of it, and uh, it's really exciting to see all the initiatives she has. Uh, how she is championing generative artists, how she is championing gender equity in the NFT space, and also how she's championing her native Panama. I loved hearing her perspective on why uh, Panama could be a really important place to develop for Web3 and the opportunities that are being afforded in more fortunate countries. Uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't be uh, extended there. And, and I think they're very fortunate to have uh, someone like Ixchels at the forefront there. How about yourself, Sam? Yeah, no, amazing to see how she's continuing to experiment and really try and and just naturally becoming just such a positive inspiration to a lot of the people around her and using a lot of her success to to give back to the people around her. I think um, that to me is literally one of the most beautiful things that I see happening in this space. Um, So to see her at the forefront and setting that precedent is incredibly powerful. Um, really enjoyed the conversation and uh, and as always we'll, we'll be back every every Wednesday you know where to find us so uh, there you have it appreciate you all for tuning in for supporting uh, we'll be back then peace peace